Welcome to one of the most important chapters for the North Carolina real estate exam. This is chapter seven on brokerage relationships. Hey everyone, today we'll be going through like 20 questions all around chapter seven. If you're looking for the actual review video around chapter seven, I'll have it linked right up here in the corner and down in the description. You don't wanna miss that. I haven't mentioned this in a while, but if you have not signed up for real estate courses yet, I'll have links down in the description below. I've recently partnered with the Superior School of Real Estate and I get a little kickback if you sign up using the links below and a lot of times they have discounts using those. Those links will work with post licensing and continuing education as well. I personally went through their course when I was doing my pre-licensing and I had been recommending them way before they were my affiliate partner. Anyway, subscribe, please hit that like button below and let's go. Question one, the employment authority of the listing agreement binds the broker to the best interest of the seller. B, gives the broker authority to screen offers for the seller. C, gives the broker the authority to screen offers for the seller. Or D, authorizes the broker to reject any offers that the broker feels are unacceptable. So, well, we start chapter seven here with a really terrible question. So employment authority really doesn't mean anything. It's just a really complex way of saying that the brokers are have obligations as an employee of the client, right? We can't make decisions for them. So brokers are not allowed to do B through D. Simple as that. The answer here is A, we work on the best interest of the seller. All right, question two. A contract in which a property owner employs a broker to market her property creates an agency relationship between which of the following? A, buyer and seller, B, buyer and broker, C, broker and seller, or D, broker, seller, and buyer. So this one is too easy. I don't even know if I need to review it, right? A property owner employs a broker to market the property. A property owner is a seller. So C, broker and seller. Question three. The typical listing contract is a form of A, universal agency, B, general agency, C, special agency, or D, free agency. So this is memorization here, but it's pretty simple. We are special agents. Universal agents can act on behalf of a principal. We can't do that. A general agent is like a property manager. They can do some things. They have some power where, again, we don't really have any power. Free agency is a sports term, <laughs> so C is the answer. Question four, which of the following is not an agency relationship? A, the relationship between a sales associate and the broker with whom the associate is associated. The relationship between a listing broker and a cooperating broker acting as a sub-agent of the seller. The relationship between a seller's agent and a buyer's agent. Or D, the relationship between a seller and the listing agent. So two agents working on both ends of a deal are not an agency relationship. Just plain simple. The answer here is C, the relationship between a seller's agent and a buyer's agent. Question five, an agent's duties to the principal include all, the, all of the following except loyalty, accountability, obedience, or legal advice. So your teacher has hopefully said this to you about a dozen times. We are not lawyers whatsoever. Do not practice law with any of your clients. So D, legal advice is not an agent's duty. The other thing here is think about the acronym old car, right? Obedience is on there. Loyalty is on there. And so is accountability. Legal advice is not. Question six, which of the following must be disclosed to a buyer or customer by the listing agent? A, the reason the seller needs to sell quickly. B, the death of the previous occupant from AIDS. C, only the material facts the seller has authorized the agent to disclose. Or D, all material facts, including those detrimental to the seller. So this is kind of another toss-up question. This chapter really seems to be pretty easy with these practice questions. Um, still very important chapter though, so read it. Chapter seven is the one I always recommend if you need help passing the test, chapter seven is it. So all material facts, no matter what, need to be disclosed. The death of anybody is not important or anyone's business. Um, answer here is D. Question seven, a broker should present A, all offers, even if the property is currently under contract to be sold. B, only those offers that appear to be in the seller's best interest. C, only those offers the broker knows have been properly pre-qualified for the mortgage. 
or D, only those offers that are for more money than the seller has indicated as his minimum for consideration? That one sounds reasonable. It's actually a very easy question once again. So not only do all material facts need to be uh, disclosed, no matter what, so do all offers, every single offer, even if somebody offers a dollar in the house. So you do not pick and choose which ones to show your client at all. Even low ball offers need to be shown. Answer here is A. Question eight. A broker is not held liable for misrepresentation or omission of material facts when A, the broker fails to disclose a defect he reasonably should have known, the broker who does not know the answer to the buyer's question, but answers anyways without regard for the facts of the situation. That's obviously not correct. C, the misrepresentation or omission was made to a buyer the broker did not represent. Or D, the broker was not aware of the misstatement and there was no way he reasonably could have been expected to know. So material facts are things you know or should know. You can't be held liable for things you don't know and can reasonably know. Right? A leak in between the walls is something that you would never know about unless there's some water damage evidence in the walls. So the answer here is D. The broker is not aware and could not have reasonably known. Question nine, misrepresentation occurs when A, the party makes a false representation and knows it to be false. B, the party makes a false representation and does not know if the statement is true or false, but should have known. C, the party making the false representation makes no effort to determine if it's even true. Or D, all of the above. A, is willful misrepresentation. B, is negligent misrepresentation. C, is one of those misrepresentations. Answer here is D, all of the above. Once you figure out that even more than one of these is correct, it's all of the above. Question 10. A listing broker has the duty to disclose to the buyer or the customer A, the amount of the commission, B, the seller's financial status, C, the seller's reason for selling, or D, structural defects. D is a material fact, the others are not. That means you don't need to disclose them. They only need to be, disclose those facts if they know that they are defects, right? So an agent is not an inspector. Question 11. The working with real estate agents brochure must be presented at first substantial contact, has the same legal weight as a listing or buyer's agency contract, should not be used if the customer desires oral buyer agency, or D should be presented at the same time as the offer to purchase. So this is like from chapter two, this goes way back. So first substantial contact is when the brochure should be presented. All of you should know this by now, by chapter seven. Question 12, designated agency is permitted, A, only when the designated agents each work within the same office for the firm. As long as the designated agent does not learn any confidential info about the other agent's principal after becoming designated, C, when the listing agent is also the buyer agent and has the written consent of both parties, or D, if the designated agent is not directly supervised by the other designated agent. So A is incorrect because agents can be at different offices. That doesn't matter. B is worded funny, but it's incorrect because the agent can't know any confidential in information before or after being designated, just period, in general. C is just dual agency, it's not designated. So the answer here is D. Like a broker in charge and a provisional broker, a brand new agent cannot be in, in a designated agency. Question 13. Which of the following statements is true regarding the Residential Property Disclosure Act? A. The act relieves agents of the responsibility to discover and disclose material facts regarding a property. B. Once a seller has completed the disclosure statement, he is under no obligation to amend the statement if the condition of the property changes. C, a seller of residential property who does not complete the residential property disclosure statement may be fined $500. Or D, a disclosure statement should be provided to the buyer no later than the time at which an offer to purchase and contract is signed by the buyer. So once you become an agent, you'll learn this on deal number one. All right, this is a real life question. <laughs> Look at that. So jump to D, when you're writing up an offer, you wanna collect the disclosures and mineral, mineral oil and gas documents 
and get those signed along with the offer to purchase. So these are like one giant envelope that you'll have signed at the same time. Question, answer here is D. Question 14, the residential property owners and disclosure statements, or your RPODs, form must be provided to purchasers in which of the following transactions? A, transaction where the purchaser already occupies the property. B, transaction where the parties agree to exempt each other from compliance. Can't do that. C, new construction never occupied. Or D, property purchased where the buyer will not be the new occupant. A is, no, can't do that. B, no, you, you're never exempt from compliance. C, it's not new construction because no previous owner to really disclose the stuff, the problems that are going on with it. D, the property is purchased where the buyer will not be the new occupant. D is the answer. Question 15. Once again, you are considering affiliating with Keller Williams. Sponsorships are an extremely important part of the company. Who should you put down as a sponsor when signing up? Sean Kelly, spelt with a U. The branch manager, Sean, or Kelly's take. If after interviewing several different brokerages, you feel like Keller Williams is a good fit for you, especially in your own specific market, I would love it if you put me down as a sponsor with the name spelling of Sean Kelly in Mooresville. It's actually a really huge part of your business with Keller Williams. It helps with profit share and everything like that. Then you should also start aiming for your own sponsors and it's a really great way to build passive income without having to sell or buy houses. I am a huge fan of Keller Williams, even without all that profit share stuff, even if you already have a sponsor to put down or whatever, I highly recommend it. And I will have a video out on why I chose them here pretty soon. But go find out for yourself and we could be really good referral partners anyway. So the answer is A, Sean Kelly with a U. Question 16, which of the following statements is true concerning designated dual agency? A, a bid can be designated dual agent if the other agent is a provisional broker under his direct supervision. A broker cannot be appointed as a designated dual agent if the broker has prior knowledge of confidential info about the other party to the transaction. Only the bit can serve as a designated agent for both parties, or D, there is no provision that allows for an oral designated dual agent to exist. Actually, completely skip this question, question 16. It's completely wrong. A bit cannot be a designated dual agent if the other agent is a provisional broker. If the agent is new, just out of school, they cannot be in designated dual agency with a broker in charge, someone that supervises them. Question 17, which of the following is not an appropriate action for the broker to undertake when acting as a seller sub-agent? Disclosure of all known material facts even when disadvantageous to the seller, preparing a CMA for a buyer, showing the buyer some comparables of similar properties to the ones listed, or D, disclosing to the seller how high the buyer is willing to pay. To be honest, I don't really get this whole sub-agent thing. I should really try to study this, but it's just not something that really comes up in my business. But a sub-agent, I guess, should not be prepare a CMA for a buyer. A CMA is a competitive market analysis where you basically get comps for the home. But the answer here is B. Question 18. Which of the following does not constitute a material fact? A readily noticeable crack in the foundation? The location of a landfill nearby the house that cannot be observed? Pending zoning changes? Or D. Willingness of the seller to accept a lower offer? So hopefully this one is a lot more obvious. These are harmful issues with the property itself, right? All of these other answers. Disclosing your negotiated problems is not a material fact. You are working at the interest of your client. Don't tell anyone your client is going lower unless it is really in the best interest and you need to get this house sold like super fast, right? Answer there is D, willingness of the seller to accept a lower offer. You don't want to play your hand. Question 19, oral buyer agency A is no longer permitted in North Carolina since buyer agency agreements must be in writing from the inception. B is permitted in North Carolina until the time an offer is presented on the buyer's behalf. C must be converted to writing no later than the time of acceptance offer by the, ex, by the seller. <clears throat> D is allowed only if the buyer agrees not to work with another agent. So oral buyer agency is permitted, so it's not A, with a listing agreement you need it in writing, but this is a buyer agency. The difference between B and C here is that one is before the offer, B, and the other is before acceptance of the offer, which is the C. So the answer here is going to be B. I have on occasion sent the agency agreement with the offer to purchase for my clients to sign all at once. 
This is kind of risky, but I've only done it with people that I know and trust, like family and friends. You ideally want the agency agreement sooner to your clients because in that way you kind of lock them in to be working with you. You'd want somebody to undercut you on that. Question 20. Alan Agent of ABC Realty is working with Betty Buyer under an oral buyer agency agreement. He shows her a house listed by Beatrice Broker of XYZ Realty. Betty wants to buy the home. Which contract does Alan prepare first? The residential property owners and disclosure statement, the oral agency conversion, C, the exclusive right to represent the buyer, <clears throat> or D, the offer to purchase. So, I mean, you want to send the offer out, yes, right away, but you also need to get the disclosure signed and the agency agreement. So, this is kind of a weird question in the real world, but the answer here is D, the offer to purchase. And I guess this does make sense because you do want to get that offer ready and going and, and have that squared away but there's other things that you need to have done before this. So uh, question 21, which type of agency agreement does not have to be in writing from the time of its inception? Exclusive right to sell agreements, exclusive right to represent buyer agreements, non-exclusive buyer agency agreements, or D, property management agreements. So think about it. Non-exclusive means the buyer can bounce from agent to agent. You're no longer exclusive, like a non-exclusive relationship. So why would that need to be in writing? Right, the answer here is C, non-exclusive buyer agency agreements. Those do not need to be in writing. Cool, so that's good old chapter seven there. Make sure you please study this chapter, chapter seven, along with chapter 11, because you will be heavily tested on this. I think chapter seven has over 21 questions on the test, and that's over 10% of the test coming just from chapter seven. Up next is chapter eight on agency contracts, and that's where you learn how to calculate how much money you'll be making in commission. Hit the like button down below, subscribe. I'll see you soon.